Uh, so we're going to uh, walk you through the list of enhancements that are part of the 10.2.1 uh, release that came out last Tuesday uh, that you should be able to go out and download uh, by getting it onto uh, your Passport Advantage site. Um, we'll talk a little bit in general about some things that have changed. Uh, we'll talk a bit about what I think is uh, one of the more noticeable uh, things that will change when you upgrade to 10 one which is uh, performance. Performance is noticeably better in this release. Um, there's some support for some additional big data sources, which as you know is a, a big theme nowadays uh, in terms of understanding uh, structured and unstructured data and uh, the zeta bytes of data that people are, are collecting and want to analyze. Uh, we'll talk through some architecture administration changes. There have been a couple of new things added to Framework Manager. Report Studio, um, both in general as well as within the active reports world. Uh, Cognos Workspace and Workspace Advanced have some updates. I'll be able to talk you through what's in mobile, but I haven't got uh, a way to share my iPad with you to show you these. You are the only participant in the conference. So, Please uh, press any clues on your coupon <laughs> to remain in conference. Our backup phone system in case the WebEx integrated uh, phone tells us no one's using the backup phone system. I apologize, guys. Anyway, so mobile, I'll be able to talk to you what those changes are. Dynamic cubes um, have some updates and so uh, as well as multi-tenancy. And actually, there's some uh, administration changes there that sort of overlap with the earlier conversation. But let's stop talking about it. Let's get into it. First thing, there's actually been uh, some look and feel changes uh, overall. When you log into Cognos, here for example, is the new uh, welcome screen. And you know, if you, you go to your, your home, you'll see that the Cognos connection uh, look and feel has changed slightly. Not to the point where I think it'll throw anyone off, but I think all of your users will be aware that Cognos has been upgraded um, when they log in for the very first time uh, after the upgrade. The, uh, this version works with the current version of TM1 and the current version of Cognos Insight. So you haven't got to wait to roll this to be, uh, if you're an Insight or a TM1 user, you haven't got to wait for them to upgrade to roll this upgrade. You can roll this upgrade. They will, uh, the current versions will connect to 10 to 1. Um, pricing and licensing remain the same. Um, so, you know, that's not to invalidate what Jesse said about enhanced consumer uh, and so on. That's all been part of the Cognos 10 changes between 8 and 10, that still all holds true. What I'm talking about is between 10.2 and 10.2.1, they've introduced no new uh, licensing levels. Uh, the pricing is not uh, changed uh, at this time. Three big themes as far as the, uh, the marketing part of, of the 10.2.1 uh, the uh, rollout. Uh, interactive visualization, this has to do with something called the RAVE engine, R-A-V-E. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk uh, through the changes to active reports because in this release, it's the first release that includes RAVE and the components that include RAVE are active reports. So we'll talk more about that then. But the interactive visualization world, this is the first of many releases that will incorporate the visualizations uh, throughout the uh, BI product. Performance, I mentioned it earlier, uh, lots of great performance improvements here. Next couple of slides after this one, in fact, we'll talk through some of the specifics there in terms of the benchmarks that uh, IBM has published uh, around this. And by the by, um, uh, we will follow up this webinar for those who, uh, folks who attended uh, with a uh, PDF that will lay out the performance improvements so no one has to be scribbling notes uh, furiously on the next two slides. Um, and then from a big data perspective, very specifically, there are some new uh, big data sources that are uh, supported in this release. I'll go through what those are as well. From a performance improvements perspective, so active reports, uh, if you've used them before, you know that these are the, the standalone uh, self-contained business intelligence tool. You run a Report Studio report, it generates an MHT file output, and it is now a self-contained BI environment that is portable, can be viewed on the iPad, uh, can be viewed through several different browsers. Um, the, uh, you know, there, there's uh, um, a push to, to get as much data in those as we can without the file sizes getting to the point where they're very difficult to distribute. Uh, so Cognos continues to focus on uh, and compressing those, getting more in it with less space. Um, with this, uh, you can get as much as three times a uh, smaller size in those active report outputs. Um, and as a result, they load much faster because, uh, you know, the, the, the whole file loads into your browser when you open it. So the smaller they are, the faster they load uh, and the less memory they're going to take. 
Um, and then what they found is with the compression algorithms, you can get actually 10 times as much data in the same space as you could prior to this release. So that's very exciting news for active reports. Uh, 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 in addition to this whole notion of the interactive visualizations that we'll cover later. Um, mobile um, is now three times faster than it was with this release, and that's primarily because of how mobile requests are being implemented and optimized. And uh, the BI server is now doing more of the heavy lifting than it was in the previous releases, um, which also, by the way, introduces some uh, additional auditing capabilities to this release, which are, are going to come in very handy with your mobile users. Um, dynamic cubes uh, have been focused on. Those were released in 10.2.1 uh, um, as, as continued to focus on improving them. Um, simplified SQL queries uh, in terms of what are generated from the cube definitions you have. Um, less memory required for um, the, the cached data. Um, and uh, improved use of the aggregate awareness uh, algorithms uh, will result in about 70 percent less memory required for caching and about double performance. Uh -huh according to the benchmarks. Uh, report bursting. The architecture has been changed to allow me to burst my reports uh, uh, and run them across multiple servers. Before, when I bursted, they all ended up um, running on one server, even a multi-server environment. Now Cognos is able to share that load while the report is bursting, resulting in six times faster execution um, and you know, better use of your overall hardware resources. I mean, you've invested in multiple servers. You might as well get some, some more use out of them, um, and this change does that. Uh, overall, from a batch report service perspective, um, improvements there of about 25% in execution times because of uh, uh, some optimizations in the batch report service. Uh, some additional file caching going on in terms of the overall architecture, which means that there's less round trips to the disks, which is far slower than round trips to memory. Um, and that has resulted in a, 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 a large reduction in overall disk activity on your servers, uh, which is uh, uh, great news. And then overall, um, the number of dispatcher threads, because of the optimized communication that's part of this release between threads, the number of threads that you will need to instantiate, therefore, is also going to be lower. Uh, not, not quite half as many, um, but uh, lower, uh, which uh, means that your systems will be loaded less to do the same amount of work. So very exciting performance improvements and very noticeable right from the get-go. As Soon as you install it, without making any other changes to your reports, you're going to see these performance gains. And then as you leverage, knowing the architecture, uh, uh, and, and you actually you purposefully leverage those changes, you're going to find even more improvements. But straight out of the box, um, we saw improvements um, with our 10 to 1 implementation after converting. Moving on to big data. Um, the, the big data news really uh, boils down to uh, IBM has chosen to support the market leaders uh, in the big data Hadoop world uh, as data sources for BI. So Cloudera, Hortonworks, AWS, uh, you know, of course, IBM Big Insights is, uh, uh, has been supported since Hadoop support was introduced, um, but the, the market leaders. Uh, you know, per the, this uh, Forrester way, for example, um, are now supported. Um, and even though Apache open source is not one of the, the uh, solutions that uh, Forrester is tracking, uh, uh, that is also now supported as a data source uh, within the 10 to 1 release. So uh, for those of us who have those data sources, this is welcome news. In terms of architecture, um, in 10 to they introduced a 64-bit gateway option. And the default, regardless of whether you installed 64-bit or 32-bit Cognos, was 32-bit gateway. Now the default gateway matches your installed bits. You install 32-bit on Windows, you get a 32-bit gateway as the default. You install 64-bit on Windows or Linux, the default is the 64-bit gateway. You still have the option to switch back and forth between them, but the default has changed. Um, there are two new administration screens. So when you launch IBM Cognos administration, um, it's under system, you're going to see a new screen there for the dynamic cube world. And uh, you're also going to see a new tab there uh, for the multi-tenant world. And I'll show you some screenshots of those later. And if we have time at the end, uh, I can even take you to those screens on my uh, environment. Um, they uh, continue to enhance the external object store support for report output archiving uh, to make that more robust and to support additional archive systems. Um, you can now set archiving on your My Folders. So the uh, external report archiving, take, save uh, outputs out of the content store, drop them into an external repository, which might even just be folders on disk. 
Um, but take them out of your content store to reduce content store bloat. Uh, you could do that on public folders uh, in the previous release. You couldn't do so on my folders. Now you can. So now you could take your users' my folders, give it an archive location, and all of the uh, saved outputs in those my folders will be offloaded from your content store to the external repository as well. And remember, keep in mind with this external repository stuff, uh, you can also you, know, you can always get at those archived items through the Cognos connection. It's not like they disappear from the Cognos connection. It's just a matter of getting them out of your content store, but still available through this one-stop uh, connection portal. Um, you can deploy uh, the uh, individual users, uh, uh, my folders, uh, without the need now for a full content store. So it used to be that for me to get uh, users, uh, my folders, uh, in and out, I had to use the full content store uh, uh, deployment archive approach. Now I can actually work with the my folders separate from the rest of all of the public content and all of the rest of the the setting. So that's really good news from an administration perspective. I mentioned this earlier because of the way we are changing, or well, IBM has changed the way that uh, mobile uh, reports are processed. That actually introduced the opportunity for Cognos to uh, audit more of what's going on uh, as you uh, run reports using the mobile devices. So uh, the audit reports uh, the samples that come uh, with your BI environment when you import those, you'll see that there are now some uh, mobile specific uh, audit reporting going on uh, uh, with 10 to 1. Um, when you uh, do the report bursting, the screenshot that's on the screen here shows you this. When you go and, and you uh, set your, uh, your bursting options when you run the report. So the screenshot there is I'm running with advanced in the background and I've checked burst the report. Now what will actually come up is a collection of options that are shown here in the picture. You can talk about run in parallel. You can talk about query re pre fetching of data, and you can talk about uh, the maximum number of keys that you're willing to process. Uh, to control um, uh, more precisely uh, the, the notion of the enhancements to report bursting. So remember I said you could burst reports across multiple machines. In other words, you run them in parallel across multiple servers. You can control whether that's on or off by default it's on. Um, when you run it. So you run it, schedule it, it saves these uh, settings in your schedule and will run with these settings. So you set them at the run time. That's different than setting the burst options in the report in Report Studio in the first place. This is about how it runs, not about how it bursts. Uh, there have been no new uh, enhancements to Query Studio, Analysis Studio, or Event Studio in this release, just to, to let you know that for sure. Uh, there were a couple things deprecated. Uh, there was a separate uh, purchase type product called IBM Cognos Statistics that gave you an object in uh, Report Studio that you could drag and drop onto a report just like you could drag and drop a list or a chart or a map. There was a statistics object. If you purchased this, um, that, uh, uh, that tool has been deprecated. So that tool is no longer purchasable uh, for 10 to 1 forward. Also from an enterprise portal uh, uh, version for SAP, uh, versions 6.0 through 7.1 uh, support for those portals have been deprecated in this release. Framework Manager has gotten a couple of changes. It's actually kind of been unusual in the last few releases for Framework Manager to change. In this case, there's two changes uh, that were uh, to Framework Manager. Uh, the first is a, a collection of four new governors, and that's the top screenshot there. So these governors are specific uh, for uh, dynamic query mode, uh, which is the 64-bit query engine, uses JDBC. Um, it's not the only query engine. It, you still have compatible query mode, which is the one that uh, was there all through eight. Um, it's still there now uh, and works the very same way. Uh, but dynamic query mode uses a lot of caching to uh, optimize queries. It's what dynamic cubes run under is dynamic query mode. Um, and uh, uh, additional governors to control um, join selection, uh, how, how the local cache is used, uh, how cursors are used, and how master detail queries um, are controlled. Uh, lots of this is about caching. Lots of this is about how memory is leveraged um, because that's the magic behind DQM. Uh, it is memory resonant and it is a hybridization of access methods between both OLAP and relational to get you optimized throughput. That in a nutshell is what DQM is all about. These governors help us control that even more uh, within the framework manager, uh, so across all the packages published from this model. In addition, there is uh, independent of DQM, there's a transaction access mode uh, property now. And this has to do with uh, stored procedure query subjects. Uh, by default, uh, heretofore, 
uh, store procedure query subjects were always accessed in read-only mode. Um, but uh, a number of us have written stored procedures uh, query subjects where we actually are going to update data when those query subjects are executed. So this access mode option allows me to specify whether I'm running the uh, store procedure query subject in read-only mode or, um, uh, in terms of the transaction that has started when it's invoked or if I'm going to start the transaction in read-write mode. Uh, so that's, that's a, another change. Uh, and this is at the, uh, the model level. So you would click on the very top of your model and look at the property sheet there. It's the same place in your model uh, that you would be setting things like, uh, I'm sorry, I, I said, I said the, the wrong thing. This is on the data source. I apologize. This is on the data source uh, or data source says in your framework model. And it's one of the, uh, the properties on the data source, just like whether you're doing limited local processing uh, or what catalog you're actually reading from with that data source. This is now uh, uh, the, what the transaction uh, access mode will be on the data source in your framework model. And all of the packages that use those data sources will inherit those settings. All right, moving on to Report Studio. There are a number of changes in Report Studio. Three of these are starred, and, and they're actually also available in Cognos Workspace Advanced, uh, because Cognos Workspace Advanced actually uses the same back-end engine as Report Studio. And so uh, these enhancements also apply there. And then there's one enhancement that is specific to the Report Studio front end uh, to that engine. Uh, so we'll go through all of these here. I'm not going to go through those starred ones again in CWA. I'll remind you that they're in CWA, but we'll talk only about the things that are unique to CWA when we get there. Uh, first of all, this Excel uh, grouping. Um, you, when I run to Excel 2007 data, uh, a grouped list, uh, or a cross-tab with nested members, um, the grouping stays, right? That formatting of, of deduplicated groups. Uh, um, will uh, remain in the Excel 2007 output. Uh, I can now control whether or not I de-group, right? So I, I, I no longer uh, uh, suppress duplicates uh, when I export. So I can present in an HTML mode with my group list grouped and I don't have duplicate uh, uh, values. And then when I, if I export that to Excel, it will automatically de-group or, uh, uh, if you will, uh, repeat the values that are in the groups. So I'll show you a picture of that. Um, text-based relational filters. You can now do um, text matching with starts with, end with, contains, um, and like, if you will. So a SQL pattern, percent, uh, RJC percent, uh, uh, kinds of constructs. Uh, so I'll give you some screenshots on that. Um, when you use Cognos Workspace, um, you're reusing components that are often authored in Report Studio. And when you reuse those components, when you expand in Cognos Workspace a report and you see the contents of it, the names of the objects uh, appear. And um, in, uh, uh, with the, the introduction of Business Insight, then renamed Cognos Workspace, um, you know, we had to start renaming our objects. I add a list, I have to give it a name. I add a chart, I have to give it a name. Um, so it was always add the chart, go to the proper sheet, change the name. Now it's add the chart and specify the name right at the time I add it. Um, also, it allows me to specify when I add uh, the object what query to use. So I can reuse a query uh, or I can create a new query and give it a name right then and there. I'll show you some screenshots of that. If there's time later, I'll show you that live. Um, and then from a dimensional source only perspective, in other words, this won't work with your relational packages, but with your cube uh, packages, your DMR packages, um, you can, when you add members to a cross tab, you can now choose to whether the values are displayed um, with the raw values, like you know, revenue dollars, or percentage of one of the totals on the axes, either your, uh, uh, your row axis or your column axis. So you can switch back and forth now um, when you define your report between the actual values and percentages. Um, when you are working with dimensional data and you have uh, large dimensions, dimensions with large numbers of values, you'll, you get the search option at the end of the first several values being displayed in the model. Um, to that search option has now been an ends with option. There's always been a starts with or a contains keywords, now there's an end with keywords. Um, and then another new one that's actually uh, kind of exciting, which is sharing sets between reports. Now, you Analysis Studio folks out there know that you've been able to do uh, the creation of sets in Analysis Studio, give those sets a name, and then in another Analysis Studio reporting against the same cube, actually borrow 
those sets and copy them to your report. This is well beyond that. This is not um, making a set available so I can copy it and now I have two independent copies of that set. This is actually allowing me to take define sets and add those set definitions to the cube package so that everyone can leverage them off the package and they're centrally maintained because the package points to a report change the report, that changes the set definition, and everyone inherits the change. So that is a very uh, uh, more robust than the feature that was part of Analysis Studio here before. So let's take a look at some of these. First of all, this Excel grouping. So this is for Excel 2007 outputs. Uh, you might re recall that the 2007 data output was introduced in the previous release. Doesn't apply to that. Excel 2002 output still in the release, but this doesn't apply to that either. This is specifically for the Excel 2007 output format. On the left, I have a, a grouped list that's grouping by product line, and product line is deduped, so I only have the product line listed once for each uh, row on my report. That very same report, when I had enabled under the report properties for that report, so this is report by report, I would enable or disable this function, enabled by default. Um, uh, excuse me, disabled by default, merged by default. So I have to go in and explicitly say don't merge them uh, on each report that I want this behavior uh, by uh, going under uh, file report properties. When I check the, uh, um, the, the, the group, it stays grouped. When I uncheck, it unchecks. So the not grouped in Excel picture on the right hand side, that is unchecked. That option is unchecked. And that's the output I'll get. I'll get the left side in HTML, the right side in Excel 2007 with that box unchecked. So that's uh, the 2007 grouping. So additional uh, value uh, from an Excel 2007 output. So I get uh, a lot more of the formatting than I do in the Excel 2007 data format that was introduced in 10.2.0. Um, uh, but I don't have to uh, uh, keep the, uh, the deduped groups. So it's, uh, it's giving me much more use uh, out of the, even this formatted uh, view from Excel 2007. So it's good stuff. Um, when I uh, uh, create a report page and I have a text column, I click on the column, I click on the funnel in Report Studio to add a filter for that guy. Um, when I do so on text items, in my uh, uh, filter options I now have, starts with end with contains and matches. It used to be I just had the list of specific values that I could pick, so I had an equals was what this dialog supported. Now I have a begins and ends contains. And then a matching SQL pattern, that's the notion of a percent of stars. There's a whole collection of characters, um, including support for escape characters that talk about um, you know, do this, then ignore some, then do this, then ignore some, then do this kinds of pattern matching. So very robust, very sensitive. When I click on the prompt for values option in the upper right of the filter condition, um, then let my user type in a SQL pattern. Um, in that prompt, uh, if that's what I'd like to do. So the begins with ends with stuff, so that's all new here. Um, if I'm writing the filter within the query explorer and I drag a filter tool over and I'm doing freeform, starts with ends with uh, uh, operators are, are available there as well. Um, you've always been able to type a like in, so the matches SQL pattern is, uh, is, is really kind of new here from the point of view of, of this dialogue when you are adding filters off of the report. Uh, definition page. So that's uh, the new text space relational filters. So the query name thing. So when I create a brand new report and I click on the map template, the map template, that's going to show up and that's going to actually let me name the object. It's going to let me uh, um, either pick an existing query or it's going to let me uh, name a new query. So I, you know, it's going to still default to query one, two, three, four as I go, but I can change them right here to the name that I want, uh, as well as change the, uh, the map. Uh, when I say off of the report template, you know, create a new report, it says what kind, I say chart, same option. So same dialogue in terms of chart options, right? But I get uh, to name the chart and I get to specify the query for that chart right here. Um, not so when I create a brand new list or cross tab, I don't get a dialogue to name my list or cross tab then. When I use those templates, I still have to select them and change their properties. However, whenever I add a second data container, whether it's a list, a cross tab, a chart, um, a singleton, a, uh, uh, a repeater table, a repeater, um, any of those guys, um, it will give me that third uh, prompt here, which is give it, you know, let me name it, 
and let me um, uh, assign it a query. Uh, I can turn off that dialog if I don't like it. But again, this is specifically because of the importance of naming option, uh, objects because we're going to be reusing so many reports in Cognos Workspace. Uh, as well as, um, you know, I think we've all, uh, all of us Report Studio folks have wished that we've been able to rename the queries in a, a bit more straightforward fashion as we add objects and reuse queries in a bit more straightforward uh, fashion and this implements that for us. So I think this is really good news. Um, for those of us who are active report authors, the data controls, uh, data deck, data drop down list, data radio button, those, uh, these, this, those do not automatically get this pop up. You will still, um, if you're going to name those, you're going to need to name them uh, in the property sheet. You're not going to get this pop up, uh, which makes sense because those uh, items are not directly addressable when you use an active report in a workspace anyway. So this I really think of as a workspace and uh, uh, focused enhancement from a naming perspective. Uh, but you know, there's one more optimizer for us as we write reports. Now, with dimensional data only, we get these two uh, uh, interesting things. So you see on the left, I've got a cross tab. It's got the product line level on the rows. It's got order method type level on the columns. And I've got revenue in the intersections. Um, I can go under the data menu, having selected the cross tab corner. So you see my revenue is hash marked there. That's selected. When I select the default measure, I can go under data, choose show value as, and you see that my uh, uh, my, my current option is actual values. That's what it is by default, but I can change it to one uh, percent of one of my two summaries or of the cross tab corner in the lower right, you know, of the grand total. Um, whether those summaries are visible is immaterial. Um, the summaries, as you know, are always available to me um, uh, for sorting and things like that. Now they're available for me to, pre to present my data as percents of those summaries as opposed to um, percents. Uh, are the actual values. And I get the percent of the, uh, the, the magic corner in the lower right that is the intersection of uh, both of my summaries. So that's the percent of summary, again, only with dimensional data. The other thing with the dimensional data, so is at the end of my list of members, when I have long lists of members in a level, there's the search option that appears so I can find uh, uh, the entries that I'm looking for. Uh, starts with, has been there, contains, and so on, have all been there, ends with, that's the new one. So you now have an ends with a keyword as opposed to what begins with a keyword option uh, for leveraging that search uh, when you're searching for members. Um, again, with the dimensional data, this is that notion of sharing sets. So um, I can uh, um, create a set. Let's say that I open a level in the, uh, the source pane. I grab uh, five of the 50 members that are in that level. I drag them onto my cross tab, and now I've added that set to my cross tab. I can select that set in my cross tab. In the picture here, I've selected the product line set. This was a, uh, a few product lines. Maybe that's the product lines that have been defined as top five. Um, uh, that would uh, certainly be another way to define a custom set. When I uh, click on them, one of the properties for that set uh, uh, in, in the property sheet under the cross tab node member representing that set is sharing. When I edit that uh, property, you'll see that I can give the shared set a name and a description at that point. Um, and when I save my report, having uh, created a shared set in that report, uh, it's actually going to uh, um, uh, have this property set, but it's not going to add it to the model, all right? But after I've saved it, and I have to save it first, I can't have it in memory only that I've named the set and have this next step work. You've got to actually save the report where you've created the saved set. You can right-click on the, um, uh, the, the model uh, um, uh, at the very, very top of the package. So the Go Data Warehouse there that's highlighted, that, that represents the package as a whole. When you right-click on it, you're going to see an Add Shared Set Report, which will let you now navigate to where you save this report that contains a shared set, and then it will add, which is what the third item here shows, it will add a new folder to the package called Shared Sets, and it will reference the report in which you've placed the name set. And now every report that uses this model could actually open the Shared Sets folder and grab that set and reuse it. Um, and then if I go to the report, in this case the one I called my report, and you're obviously going to want to save these in the public folders and not in my folders, uh, otherwise it's going to be awfully hard for people to reuse them. I can then, um, I can change this. If I, it was top three and I want to change it to top five, I can do that. And then the reports that are leveraging that shared set will now show top five. 
Um, there are some controls about when the set uh, contents are refreshed that are also part of this. Um, you can make a, a set available for inclusion in uh, multiple uh, reports uh, uh, and, and have it not change until you go and refresh it manually for that report or actually tell it to auto uh, refresh. So uh, this notion of shared sets, right, if I have a collection of, of countries that I consider my developing markets and those are volatile, um, it used to be that I would just have to define them in all the reports where I want to do a report on developing or create a developing uh, country's uh, uh, dimension. Uh, now what I could do is I could actually write a report whose sole purpose in life is to let me define this developing country's set. Share that report and its shared set and maintain that centrally on the Cognos connection. And then when a new country um, becomes part of developing nations or when I promote a country out of developing nations into my mainstream nations, right, I can manage that set in that report. And then all of my developing nations reports will use the new set of developing nations as it, as it changes. So this is the kind of use that I would see for this sort of capability. I think it's going to be very powerful um, and put the management of those kinds of custom sets of members in the hands of your, your uh, uh, report authors and not in the hands of your modelers, uh, which I think means that you can actually spread that load a bit more. So that's the notion there. Now moving on to active reports, I'll do the, uh, an important one, but not the flashy one. First, this is uh, an update to the active reports properties. So when you're creating an active report in Report Studio, under File, you'll find an active report properties option. When you open that, you'll see you have two new checkboxes. The first checkbox allows you to invoke the new compression algorithms for your MHT file. So by default, these are on. So by default, it will compress. Um, and this will allow you to put more data into the MHT. Uh, so you can turn off that compression if that makes sense to you and you want to do that. Um, uh, but by default, it's on. And so this is how we can uh, get smaller MHT files without making any other changes to how our report runs. Additionally, there is this, one, this checkbox called Scalable. And what Scalable, when it's enabled, allows you to do is when that active report is viewed on a mobile device, uh, the iPad, um, you can now use pinch to zoom gestures on that active report, which were not enabled before. You can disable that by unchecking scalable on the report. But if you want that pinch to zoom behavior on your active report, scalable has to be checked. Again, these are on by default. You would have to go in here and uncheck them to remove that functionality. But these are the two new options in your active report properties. Probably the more uh, uh, um, exciting enhancement to um, active reports, and I guess to Cognos BI in general, as this is going to become more pervasive in future releases, is the introduction of the rapidly adaptive visualization engine. RAVE is what it's called. And RAVE is an engine that allows people, uh, eventually us end user types, by the by, um, I'm told somewhere in the around um, six months there'll be, a, a, if you will, let me call it this, a studio. Uh, for us to use to describe visualizations. Right now, there's a limited set of folks, partners, who uh, have access to this tool set, and of course, our friends at IBM as well, um, that will let you use this RAVE engine to create um, visualizations. So this is an extensible set of visualizations that, if you will, is being crowdsourced. Uh, and if you go to the analyticszone.com, right now today, you can download on the order of 30 new visualizations. Uh, these are uh, tree maps, heat maps, uh, packed bubble. Um, there's additionally, uh, you know, uh, the, the, our old favorites, column charts and bar charts and so on. So you know, ultimately, you should be able to write active reports um, and, and use only RAID visualizations, uh, if you like. Now, why would you do that? Well, I'm going to say there's probably two immediate reasons. Number one, they are far more visually interesting and, to, uh, and, and in some cases, uh, animated. Uh, and number two, they take up less space than a chart or uh, 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 will. A traditional Cognos chart or map will take up more space. And the reason for that is because the RAID engine is actually embedded in the MHT. So instead of having to prefabricate all of the possible uh, outputs uh, for uh, a, a bar chart or a bubble chart or a network chart, um, as would happen in previous releases, it, it can now just generate them on the fly based on the data in the MHT. So no longer am I actually taking up space in the MHT file with the pre-built charts. It'll build the charts on the fly 
using the data that is the result of the interactions that you've coded into your active report. So they get much smaller and they're faster. And you know, on top of that, if you'll let me say it, they're also very cool. So I'm going to actually bring over the sample report, if I can do so here. Um, that uh, is the one that I've got the screenshot of there and just give you a notion of what I mean by interactive. So this is a, um, a collection of pages. If you, you start on this first page, and this, by the way, if you download the new iPad app, this is a sample that is embedded in the iPad app. I just happen to have it extracted from the iPad app to uh, share with you uh, on, via this WebEx today. Um, but you see, I've got this sort of overview, um, and if I click over here, I've got uh, this bubble chart, and as I start adding in um, areas, the bubble chart goes, and this is an active report, which means that components of my charts, even my visualizations, can be used as filters to filter my data. So as you see, as I click on individual bubbles, right, it's filtering my data. But, you know, I've got um, these, uh, this notion here of uh, not only do I have, right, see how my, my chart is changing, but it's not changing just by going and flashing up the new report. It's actually growing and shrinking the report, yeah? Um, you know, I've got these network type visualizations. I've got, uh, this is a tree diagram type visualization. Uh, there's heat map visualizations. I think I mentioned this, but there's 30, as of yesterday, 30 downloadable visualizations that you can add to uh, your visualization library. And this is an extensible library. Every time somebody adds a new one, you can go out and download it. Um, there is uh, a community uh, out there um, called Many Eyes that you can join. And if you're willing to, you can uh, upload your data set. So this should be public data. Um, uh, but you know, maybe representative of data you'd like to get uh, visualized in a new way. And you can crowdsource ideas for visualizations. You can try out the ones that are there in the many eyes, but you can also uh, uh, ask others who have access to this visualization designer tool to design a visualization specific to your data, um, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, and then, you know, those are all shareable uh, and will eventually become downloadable as well. So how do I do this? Well, in my report studio, I have um, a toolbox for my active reports and one of the tools that's active report specific today, but this will become more and more pervasive through all reports uh, in future releases. I drag a visualization tool and drop it on my report where I want the visualization and up will come the visualization gallery, which will be empty when you install. You have to go out and download these after you install and then incorporate them uh, through the IBM uh, administration screen on the Cognos connection into uh, your library, and then you'll be able to access the library of visualizations here. So I went out and I downloaded uh, these seven, okay? And then um, I have a heat map here so you can see what a heat map is uh, versus a tree map. So these are a few of the uh, items. And once you've got them in, they've got properties, they've got drop zones, they have interactive behavior, just like every other object. Uh, in an active report, and a lot like the standard charts out of the box. So this is a very, very exciting uh, development in my mind in terms of being able to produce visually stimulating active reports that can run both on the iPad as well as on um, IE and Firefox. My IE friends, uh, you will need to install uh, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft's um, Silver, Silverlight, that's it. I was going to call it Silverline, and I knew that was wrong. Microsoft Silverlight, uh, because uh, the Wave Engine does uh, depend on that. Uh, Firefox users uh, won't need to do that, and you don't need to worry about that on your iPad. So that's the Wave Engine. That's the new visualization tool, and this, I think, is going to be a big, big hit. Cognos Workspace Advanced, uh, I mentioned they have the dimensional changes, the text filter change, the grouping changes. Um, there's also a custom grouping change here. It used to be that you had to use the custom grouping tool, so you'd select uh, what you wanted to create a custom group out of, and then you'd click a button to do a custom group. The only enhancement uh, uh, that's unique to Workspace Advanced here is you can right-click now and choose Create Custom Groups from the right-click menu. That's the only other change. Everything else here is also the changes that I went over when we went over them in report. Studio. Cognos Workspace um, has a, a few changes in this release as well. Probably the one that I think is going to be most welcome is the ability to map like items 
and slider and select value filters. So the notion here is this. In one report widget, I have year. In another report widget, I have um, uh, start year. Cognos Workspace and 10.2.0 thinks of those as two separate years. Therefore, when I add a slider filter or a select value filter to my workspace, it will bring them up as separate fields. And even though they're both years, and I'd like to be able to filter both widgets on 2010 or 2013, um, I can't in 10.2.0 uh, because they're separate columns. In 10.2.1, I can fix that. Uh, I'll show you a, a screenshot on that. Um, in previous releases, once I added a filter and it went out and it read the values from the data source, um, it didn't auto refresh. Uh, so when I added new values, so if I had a list of sales reps and I was going to pick sales reps in a filter, and uh, yesterday when I added the filter, uh, uh, Jesse didn't work for me. Uh, last night I added Jesse, he's there today. That filter won't show up with Jesse. With these enhancements, I can now tell that filter to refresh, so Jesse will be in the filter. So new values in your data sources. Um, you can now control that those will uh, arrive in your slider and uh, select value filters in your workspace. Um, drill behavior on your workspace, uh, there were some issues. In my mind, these were issues, um, I, I, I guess, since this is a list of enhancements. Um, there was a feature in previous releases that uh, formatting and nesting uh, was not retained on drill when uh, you drilled on your workspace. That has been changed. In this release now, uh, uh, formatting and nesting uh, will be retained as you drill uh, across multiple widgets on your workspace. Um, and then uh, the uh, uh, enhancements to the chart recommender. So in 10.2.0, they introduced the chart recommender. I can take a chart, I can click on a button, and Cognos will tell me, you know what, there are, the, there are other ways to view this data. Here's my top five picks for the best way from best to uh, less best in terms of the five different views. All right, and you could actually click on a more button there and get the why, um, but the why wasn't particularly um, illuminating. Uh, they've improved dramatically uh, of the why in this release, and so you can actually figure out why Cognos thought that that might be the right way, a better way, the best way to view your data. So that's what the uh, chart recommender enhancement is. But again, I think the most important one uh, in my experience of what people are looking for and um, perhaps dislike is this notion of like items not being able to be mapped. So my example was I have two years. I have a year and in my example here, year close date. And out of the box up until now, I had no choice to say I want to filter both widgets because they're both year, they just happen to be different names. Um, and I couldn't say that they're the same thing before. Now there's a checkbox up in the upper right that says I'm going to filter on multiple related data items that allows these were radio buttons. When I check that on, they become checkboxes. And I can pick, okay, these two guys, they're actually the same data. So let's build one filter and filter for both of those columns, which now means I can filter my two widgets with this one filter, whereas with this unchecked, I will be able to build a filter for a year and a separate filter for year close date. So I still have that option, but for those times when you know they're really the same data and I want one filter that filters both, I now have that. That's the change. And I think that's a very welcome change uh, for, uh, for, uh, for all of us versus go and rewrite all our reports to rename all of our columns. Cognos Mobile, I can tell you, I just can't show you because I don't have any way to share my iPad, I'm afraid. Um, from a UI perspective, go out today, download the new iPad app. Not only does it work with 10.2.1, but it's also backwards compatible uh, back to 10.1.1. Um, brand new user interface, a lot more uh, um, iPad native feeling. Um, you can, uh, you'll, you'll find that when you get on it, there's some settings you have to do, including typing in your IBM Cognos uh, URL. If you want to save your end users from having to type in the, that URL, um, you can actually craft an email to your users, give them uh, an embedded link in that email, and you can click on that embedded link, and it will actually configure the uh, iPad app. So that's new. Um, overall, it's faster because uh, I think a lot more is actually being handled on the server and then the results are being sent down. HTML reports are going to render much better in this, this view, much better. Primarily because it's actually now able to leverage HTML5 type controls. Um, so you've got more fonts, page layout uh, is, is respected more so. The, the, the view of the HTML page on the iPad and on a browser are going to be far more um, the same, your prompt controls because of this HTML upgrade um, are going to work far more like uh, they do on the browser. 
Um, drill through actions uh, uh, in terms of how you invoke them and how you leverage them are better. Um, and it also will present um, saved HTML output um, in the same high fidelity way. So that's all, it's all good. It's all, it's all welcome and good stuff. Um, the uh, 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 capabilities for workspace on mobile devices, um, drill through actions between active reports and regular reports, those have not changed. They are identical in this release. Those have not been touched. Um, new is zooming on active reports. So if I have that uh, scalable option checked in my active report when I generate it, I'll be able to do that pinch and zoom uh, on the iPad. Uh, the audit logging I talk, touched on uh, now two times. Um, um, because of the architectural changes about how reports are run, audit logging on the, uh, of what's happening on the iPad app is now possible. There's also um, logging that you can invoke on the iPad app itself and in conjunction with uh, iTunes access logs off of the Apple iPad uh, for troubleshooting. So that's also really good. And then the touch-friendly prompts, that's all part of that high-fidelity HTML. And that's, uh, again, um, uh, part of, of making the prompt controls that work in the iPad look more like the prompt controls that work in browsers. So that's your list of uh, mobile updates. Dynamic cubes have been enhanced as well. Um, uh, you can now secure dimensions uh, and attributes. Uh, whereas before, uh, you could only uh, secure uh, dimensions. Uh, you can now use security tables. Uh, so before, to do security, it was about creating custom sets of members and, talk, and, and adding uh, views uh, uh, and filters to your cube and then assigning groups to those views um, uh, in the Cognos uh, uh, connection administration screens. That all still works the same way. However, I also can incorporate now uh, database security tables um, and, 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 uh, and leverage the, uh, uh, my database for that security instead of doing it with custom views. Um, I've got more relative time rules. Uh, so I can now do first, last, and current period uh, and my relative time stuff, uh, bringing this more in line with kind of uh, capabilities that are part of PowerPlay. The auto designer is uh, far better at detecting um, uh, levels. So it used to have the auto designer would create, would detect dimensions well. But the levels within dimensions, not so much. Um, with, uh, with this release, um, it's really much better at um, reading the data, understanding what is probably a, a level and made up of other levels, and actually uh, using that in the auto design output. Um, if you are an InfoSphere warehousing cubing services person, you can export those models and import them now into the cube design. Um, so you can, uh, you can leverage uh, your, your uh, InfoSphere cubes um, you can now create dynamic cube versions of those as well. And there's a whole new uh, administration screen uh, for dynamic cubes. Uh, it used to be that when you uh, were publishing a cube and you wanted to manage the security, you want to start and stop it, you actually had to go to several different places in the administration screens. What they've done under status is they've given you this data stores option where you can now go and you can manage your cubes here um, and do, as soon as you've created the, the data source by publishing it from the cube designer, you can come here and you can manage your cubes and do everything here, including manage the security views, um, start them, stop them, refresh your cache, everything, and also put your scorecard stuff on them, which is why it's part of the status tab, is because of this whole notion of scoring now on the cube level is here. Um, this is also where you would go to deploy them to multiple dispatchers. So a uh, great enhancement uh, for us dynamic cubies to come to one place for the cubes to, to manage them. Multi-tenant has some enhancements, and this is actually the last enhancement screen, so we'll actually get to the, the question and answers in maybe a minute to spare. Um, you can uh, now either include or not public content when you deploy um, tenants. Uh, it used to be that when you deployed uh, your, 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 uh, for your tenants, you, you couldn't choose whether to include or not your public content. Now you can. There's a whole new administration tab now for multi-tenancy that gives you a bunch of new features like adding the tenant IDs by hand um, uh, as opposed to uh, having to do uh, impersonation or other login events to get the tenant IDs into the content store. Removing the same uh, from the content store. Creating a, a profile for the tenant where you uh, can set uh, their tabs and their, their default skin and that kind of thing by tenant. Uh, you can lock out a tenant uh, either permanently or for a time. Uh, you can cancel all the sessions of the tenant. So if you're going to be doing an upgrade and you want to be sure nobody's on while you're upgrading, you can cancel the sessions, disable, upgrade, re-enable, and there you go. 
Um, and then you can also export from the content store utilization CSV where you can go and you can uh, analyze just how much space in your content store is each tenant taking up object by object. This is your tenant administration screen. A lot of buttons up here for locking and unlocking. That's that enable, disable. You can also, you also got a, a drop down menu by tenant. You can add a tenant, delete a tenant. Um, you can do uh, your default uh, uh, user profiles by buttons or by this measure. So again, centralizing the management of and increasing the options for management of multi-tenancy, big, big changes, big, big enhancements as far as this release goes. So we did it. I ended at 1 o'clock. I apologize for that. Um, we'll stay on and do a, uh, questions and answers for a few minutes here. If you're willing to stay on, we'd love to have you. If you have to get off, this session is being recorded. Any Q&As we do in the session will be part of that recording. You can fast forward to the end to hear them. Um, also, any questions we don't get to, as Jesse said earlier, we're going to uh, do our best to get you some answers to those in writing after the fact. Jesse, what questions are we getting? All right. Uh, so the first question is on Internet Explorer compatibility. So this is a test because I know you're not looking at the, at the specifications directly in front of you, but IE, what, so what version of IE can it support? <laughs> well, that's what I actually went and looked up. Okay, good. Um, you know, so the support environments page for 10.2.1 is a vastly different look and feel than for previous releases. Um, I don't know if this brings it in compliance with other uh, IBM products or whether um, this is the new one that all the other uh, IBM products are going to migrate to this layout. But there is a supported environments page for 10.2.1. The listed supported browsers are uh, 8, 9, and 10. Um, but 10 still has the caveat of only supporting in uh, compatible mode. So you have to be in compatible mode with 10. Uh, so, it's not, uh, so that's we'll click the compatible button and you're good to go. Um, so 8, 9, and 10 uh, okay. for IE. Okay. Firefox is still 17 ESR, by the by. It has to be the ESR, and 17 is the one. Uh, so for Firefox folks who auto-update, uh, you're going to need to regress right. because you're probably on 21. And we're getting several questions now on specific product compatibility. So what we'll do is in our follow-up email to everyone, we'll send a link directly to the compatibility page. And I will follow up with each of you who have asked a specific question on a version. I'll look it up and send you details. Um, another question we have, Rich, is just, um, and this came up when you were showing some of the visualizations. Sure. It was just around, are there, what's the out-of-box geospatial or, or capabilities of the product? So is there any out-of-box geospatial compatibility? Okay. Right now, um, I don't see uh, any visualizations out on the analytics zone that are uh, mapped. Okay, that are spatial related, spatial context related. Um, I don't know, uh, since I don't have access to the visualization designer, whether that's a capability that's in the designer or not. All I can tell you is what's been published does not include a collection of maps. So um, certainly still the, uh, the map uh, object in Report Studio is there for the, uh, uh, the, the map info maps that come out of the box. Um, and then there is the, uh, the add-on. Uh, and there's a webinar out there that you can play back on this add-on. This is the IBM Cognos for Azure Maps that lets you do spatial analytics um, with Cognos, and certainly that is still um, available. Uh, but from a visualizations perspective, right now on the analytics zone, um, I don't, I had, did not see any spatial visualizations available for download. Um, but they may actually come, um, and if you're interested, uh, you may actually be able to get uh, to be part of that um, program by enrolling in the Many Eyes uh, community. Right, the next question just is on the visualizations. We're actually building them. I mean, so the question is just is how does it differ than like building a chart? Um, so it, it not much. Properties. Yeah, not much different. Um, let me let me bring up Report Studio while we're while we're talking here. Uh, maybe you can ask me another question while I'm bringing up Report Studio, and then I'll show you the visualization okay. drop. Safari compatibility. Um, Safari compatibility did not change in this release, so uh, the versions are the same, and uh, Safari is a consumer-only browser. It is not a, a developer browser, similar uh, Chrome. So Chrome and Safari are supported. Um, you can consume with them, including workspaces, for, uh, uh, just like you could in 10.2.0. Um, they're, they're still not developer environments. Okay. Uh, we have a question on tenant. What is a tenant? Can you sure. So a tenant, um, we introduced in 10.2.0, is this notion of multi-tenant. Um, and it's a, a new layer of security um, to use that's independent of groups and roles, uh, because you used to have to deal with this notion of tenancy with groups and roles. Now they've given you a separate way 
um, uh, so that enhances the capability. And the notion here is you have um, uh, groups of users. These might be uh, customers of yours, um, or they might be groups of users inside. It actually doesn't matter. The concept still applies. Where you have objects that are unique to them and you want to guarantee in an audible, auditable way that only that group can get at those objects. Um, and that other group, other people can get only at their objects and so on. So a commingled environment across tenants. Plus have content that everybody, all your tenants can hit. That would be called public contents. So if you have a, a world where you've got mutual exclusion, uh, a collection of objects that are just for this group, just for this group, just for this group, plus perhaps a collection of objects that are common to all groups. This multi-tenancy feature allows you to implement that security separate from groups and roles, which is probably how you're implementing it today. And once you've implemented the tenants like that, you get all these um, new uh, administration features like importing content or exporting content from tenant, moving a tenant from one environment to another, um, uh, giving the default uh, uh, view to a tenant, uh, enabling or disabling access by that tenant, uh, and so on are all part of the new that tenant feature. So once you leverage this to isolate your objects by tenant, you get all this cool administrative uh, context as well. And for OEMs, if you happen to be an OEM and you're, you're, show, you're using Cognos to show information to your customers, certainly if you haven't looked into tenancy yet, that's something, or multi-tenancy, that's something you're going to want to evaluate. So active reports, toolbox, as you know, the toolbox changes when you use the active report template. New tool called visualization dropper in. Looks just like the chart wizard, only it's your visualization wizard that comes up. Here is your collection uh, visualization. So I'll drop a, a, a heat map on and click OK. Now, I have, um, just like I have X and, uh, I have series and categories on bar charts and a default measure, hey, I have uh, a color measure, a category uh, and, uh, 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 for the x-axis and a category for the y-axis, and I have my interaction uh, buttons. So at this point, it feels just like a chart in an active report. I do my interactions the same way, I have my drop zones the same way, so, you know, I could quickly build uh, from my model, you know, a, uh, a grabbing some, uh, you know, grab my uh, my quantity for my color. I can grab a product line for one of my categories. I can grab, uh, oh, let's go with something like order method for my other category. And just like I was creating a, a chart, and by the way, these extra categories, these act like the properties property, by the way. So if you need to include things that are not visible, these actually drop zones, which I think is a big improvement over the properties property. And now I, just like that, I've built, uh, and now this will take some time because it's building an active report. Um, so, uh, oh, it didn't take uh, much time at all. Well, you know, it is faster and improved. I told you there were performance improvements. So here you go. So here is my uh, my real, real quick heat map um, example. So that's how easy it is to add a visualization that you downloaded from the analytics zone. So hopefully that, that helps the, the, the person who asked. Okay, we have a couple of questions around the upgrade and, and, and how, is this different than other upgrades? Is this, uh, can you talk to how people upgrade in the process? Um, with this release, like the releases before it, because the number changed, you should be planning on this being an uninstall, reinstall, or install a new place um, as though it were a brand new one. So not a fixed pack. So even though the third number is the number that changed, this is not a fixed pack. If you go to Fix Central and download a fixed pack, that overlays your environment. That's a install it on top of my existing software, restart Cognos, off I go. This is not a fixed pack. This is an, a new release, um, and we don't have a release in place concept as yet. So this would be a, um, you know, if you're going to install on the very same server, you would uninstall, reinstall, or you would, uh, you know, shut down your current Cognos um, uh, 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 on that server, install this in a new folder, configure it, and bring it up in that new folder. So it's not a fixed pack overlay. So you need to plan this upgrade like you would plan any other upgrade. It's an upgrade. It's, there's, nothing, there's no uh, shortcuts on this one. And a related question, can you have multiple versions of Cognos on the same physical server? You certainly can. Um, you know, I'm going to make this the rash assumption that your server can handle the load that that would put on it. But if you've got a robust enough server, it is absolutely possible to take uh, and put a 10.2.0 installation and a 10.2.1 installation on the same server. A few things. They cannot be pointing to the same content. They are independent. There's no way to mix and match multiple uh, versions to one content store and make one environment out of it. 
Um, but you can add a 10 to uh, on a server, and it's going to be listening on a collection of ports and be pointing to a content store database. You can then have a 10 to 1 installation on that very same server, put into a different content store, listening on different ports, and that is absolutely a supportable configuration. I'm not sure it's a great production configuration, but from a development or sandbox uh, perspective, this is something we actually have to uh, implement uh, any number of times. And then, of course, now when they're both out, I can use Lifecycle Manager and compare and contrast the two. And, you know, the upgrade assessment that I mentioned.